one step past. Action Heroes of History Adventure Man, John D. Craig This man's entire life was one big adventure. The only thing ordinary about him is his name. Even then, he had to add a middle initial because he originally did not have one. Early Days John Craig was born on April 28, 1903 in Cincinnati, Ohio. He was the second of five children, all boys. John's father, also named John, came from Scotland. His mother, Marie, came from Massachusetts. The elder John Craig was an adventuresome spirit who really didn't like to talk about his early life. It wouldn't be until years later that the younger John Craig would discover amazing life parallels to his father. John only knew his dad as a very anchored family man and an engineer. John Craig's family moved to Toronto, Canada when he was very little. It was here when he had his first two major encounters with nature. The first was a mishap. He fell into a snowdrift and nearly froze. No! The second experience was when his father had taught him how to track deer. When John turned eight, the family moved to Long Beach, California. This was an extreme lifestyle change. Winter was a reality in Canada. In Long Beach, it became the stuff of storybooks and newspapers. However, his dad had friends who had camps in the mountains, so he would go there to hike and ride horses. At the age of 10, John learned to ride bareback. When he was 11, he learned to swim in the Pacific Ocean. All the skills he had learned so far in life would become absolutely essential to what he would do later on. Bad stuff happens in batches. At the age of 12, John neglected a cold and got an asthmatic condition that nearly made him an invalid. He couldn't participate in sports or do anything very physical. He spent long weeks in bed and, instead, read a lot of books. This continued through high school. His being a bookworm led to him being an honor student. He was so convinced of this delicate health that he didn't envision himself ever having friends or a wife. John just thought it was going to be him and his books. Boy, did that turn out to be wrong. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Turning 16 is rough for just about everyone. It was rougher for John Craig than most people. All of his bad health piled up on him at once. He had a bad, long-lasting cold, asthma, bronchitis, and other ailments. When he recovered, he was normal and healthy again, for the first time in four years. After that, John was rarely ever sick. He gained one victory, but suffered a crushing loss. In the spring of that year, when John was still 16, his father died. Not only did the loss of John's father shake up the family, for the obvious reason, but they also discovered they were very poor. John's father didn't do anything wrong, but he had all his money tied up in an invention. There was an ongoing feud between the officers of the company, and a lawsuit carried on. The Craig's money was just gone. John joins the workforce. John's older brother, Tom, had already been working. His three younger brothers were too young to help. John quit high school, which he was good at, and decided to get a job. He didn't like lying, but he told people that he was 21 and not 16, just so he could help put food on the family table. John's dad had worked at the Union Tool Company in Torrance, California. He wasn't fooling anyone with his claim of being 21, but one of the higher-ups by the name of George Smith had been a friend of his father and decided to hire him. He started as a stock boy, but in a little over three years, he had his own office and was given the title of Chief Clerk, Mining and Engineering Department. What that meant was troubleshooter. It was the early 1920s, and cars and airplanes were becoming more widely used. The demand for oil was great. 
the Union Tool Company was supplying drills, pumps, and tools for the many wells that were popping up everywhere. When something went wrong, John or one of his guys went to take care of it. These were long, hard days. He went to night school during this time as well. John didn't have a lot of fun during the years he worked for Union Tool. The only bright spots in his life back then were little vacations he took in the Sierra Nevada. There he could do all the things he liked to do, like hunting, fishing, and camping. Life was simpler like this, and he could do things on his own terms. John was buddies with the forest rangers in the Sierra Nevada. They taught him not to be afraid of rattlesnakes. Wait a minute. Not be afraid of rattlesnakes? How does that make sense? Before I get into this, I want to make it clear that rattlesnakes can still be very dangerous. I don't want anyone hearing what I say and taking stupid chances. But here's the lowdown. The rangers showed John a trick on how to deal with rattlesnakes. If you flicked a handkerchief at a rattler, it would strike at the cloth. The rattler's teeth would catch in the cloth. After that, you could whirl the snake around your head, smash it against a tree or rock, or even catch it by the head, whatever you wanted to do. If some of the legends people hear about rattlesnakes were true, you would have to be some court jester kind of idiot to pull that stunt. However, John learned some things about rattlers that he never forgot. For one, they cannot strike faster than the eye can see. They can only strike one third of their own length, so they can't get you from several feet away. Most importantly, if a rattlesnake misses you, it must coil again before it strikes. John realized that handling rattlesnakes was nowhere near as dangerous as the chances he had been taking every day when he rode his motorcycle in the traffic of Los Angeles, Pasadena, and Long Beach. Even back in the 1920s, traffic in those cities was terrible. The get-rich-quick scheme that worked, or how John picked up a sidekick. Get-rich-quick schemes get a lot of bad press due to the fact that most of them don't work. However, if it's a good idea in the first place, and it's successful, it can't possibly be a bad thing. For this to happen, you better have some opportunity that falls in your lap first. This is what happened for John, and it changed the course of his life forever. It was a hot summer afternoon in 1922. There was an emergency with an oil well, and John had to fix it personally. Disaster was averted, and the superintendent of the well was grateful. The guy was making small talk, and he told John about how the Shell Company was going to drill for oil on Signal Hill. They've got the whole northeast side plotted and leased, the man told John. John remembered the place well. He used to go there and shoot rabbits with his dad. He also remembered something his father worked on in the past. He had his mother hold off supper when he went through his dad's papers. He knew that his dad made a map of Signal Hill, charting the geological strata. John found his dad's map. He also had another map of Signal Hill with him. Comparing the two maps, John found that his father's had a heavy black line marked anticline. What does anticline mean? An anticline is a ridge-shaped fold of stratified rock in which the strata slope downward from the crest. To John, this indicated probably an oil dome on the hill. What John also discovered is that this possible oil strike was nowhere near the northeast corner of the hill. Shell had it wrong. John's dad was good at a great many things. The younger John knew that the older John couldn't be wrong about this. It was also labeled with Typical Petroleum Mining Area. Shell was certainly wrong. They would drill on the northeast side, discover their mistake, then move operations to the southeast side. 
What if John was to get his hands on the southeast side before Shell did, so they would have to lease the land from him? In the middle of that southeast section was an avocado ranch. It was owned by Jacko Osborne, a friend of the Craigs for years. The next day, John went to see him. Jacko was a very distinct personality. He was extremely English. No matter where he was or what he was doing, Jacko was always very, very English. John straight up wanted to go into business with Jacko. This turned out to be a fateful meeting. Jacko would become a sidekick to John, and they would have a lot of adventures together. But that's getting a little ahead of ourselves. Hold your horses! Said John to Jacko, I have some money saved. If you would put in the ranch, we can buy some additional land. Then we can lease the land to Shell and make money off the royalties. Currently, we'll make one-sixth of the price of each barrel of oil from the wells on the land. Jacko was fond of John's father and knew he had been a good engineer. Anything is better than the avocado business, he said, and the partnership was made. It wasn't exactly an overnight success, but it didn't take long. John went back to work and carried on with business as usual. One day, Jacko called up John and told him about an offer they had received by three small independent oil companies. Forget them, John said. We're waiting for Shell. Jacko was getting a little nervous, but John knew that if the smaller fly-by-night companies were pursuing the land, the big dogs like Shell weren't far behind them. Just five minutes after that phone conversation, Jacko called John again. It was Shell. Just that quick. The deal was made. John had worked so hard at his job, and so hard on his partnership with Jacko that it took a mental and physical toll on him. The doctor made a house call and gave his diagnosis. John had the flu and a nervous breakdown. His suggestion was a three-month vacation in the mountains. Can't do it, John muttered. Got to work. It was then that his mother told him, You can do anything you want, John. The wells have come in. You're rich. She was right. John was rich, and he stayed rich. He could do anything he wanted, and he did. It's important to keep in mind that John wasn't financially obliged to do any of the fantastic things he did later on in his life. He did these things because he wanted to, and what a full life he had. To be continued... John has a big story to tell, and we're just getting started. What will John and Jacko get themselves into next? And how does a hot Australian nurse named Sonny fit into all this? Also, John buys something that he didn't want to buy, but it ends up defining his life's work. Thank you for watching. I hope you liked it. If you're anything like me, you can't wait to see what happens next in the life of this true action hero of history.